Hello and welcome to Web of Light. And I want to greet everybody this day after Thanksgiving. Hopefully you all had a good Thanksgiving. And you know, I, I want to start because we're actually going to be doing a show on giving today. Um, and in fact, the first thing we did for the show on giving is we gave and 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 she, <sighs> she ran away from home again. Mrs. Partridge is off on the road to go take care of one of her little baby partridges. So I guess we started the giving day by giving her the day off. Oh well, somebody had to do it, but I'm still here for you today. So hopefully you had a good Thanksgiving. Hopefully it was a time when you took some time to actually give some thanks. To really go inside and say, what do I have to be grateful for? Who do I have to be grateful for? And you know, it's always an interesting day to get quiet for a moment and remember that which irritated you or you were upset by or you really were angered by or felt like you were betrayed and to figure out where was the gratitude there? Where, where did you need to learn something there? Can you look back now to that person that maybe dumped you when you were in high school as their sweetheart and say, oh, I see you now, thank God you left me and I got such a better relationship going now 25 years later, or are you still holding a grudge because you got dumped in high school? Because, you know, grudges, they weigh a lot. They don't look really big, but God, they're tons of weight. And every time we hold a grudge or resentment, it holds us back. So hopefully on this Thanksgiving, you got to give some thanks and give some goodbyes and move some things on and out of your life so that you could make space for more things to give thanks for. So I'm going to start today's show by reading a few quotes about giving, since this is the giving season. Uh, and then we're going to bring on today's guest. I'd like to start with one of my faves out of history, Benjamin Franklin. Uh, ever so, actually, since I was a little kid, when I was a, when I was a small child, when I say small child, actually six, seven years old, but we had somebody came and they asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I said I wanted to be like Ben Franklin or Al Capone. Those were my two choices at the time. Um, since the guy was a corrections officer that was there to visit us about our stepbrother, he thought those were interesting choices. He said, depending on which way you go, I may or may not be seeing you in the future. I always remembered that. Never did see him. See, that's the beauty of not getting caught. Oh, so anyway, so Benjamin Franklin. A man wrapped up in himself makes a very small bundle. Also, we have some wisdom from Anne Frank, who definitely had what some people would see as not a lot to be grateful for. And yet, she said, no one has ever become poor by giving. And lastly, since it is the season, uh, we're going to take something from Francis of Assisi. It is in giving that we receive. So with those three thoughts out there, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to ask our ladies on the stage today to share and play the part of uh, Angie and discuss a little bit uh, about what they think of those quotes. Today we have Reverend Allison Palm. She became the Nashua Unitarian Universalist in minister uh, in August 2015. She's a lifetime Unitarian Universalist, also known as UU's. UU originally from Minnesota and a Minnesota native. She's typically in her office Monday through Wednesday. She's available to meet with you for pastoral care, to answer questions, share concerns or joys, or to help you how, think how you might connect more to the life of the church. She's available to officiate rites of passage ceremonies, including child blessings, dedications, weddings, or memorials. We also have Sandra G Greenfield today, who is the Director of Faith Formation. She is actually an interim director so she's going to come into the church, she's going to form some faith all over the place, and then she's going to stick somebody in there to clean up her messes, I mean, to, to carry on uh, <laughs> as she moves on and follows a very interesting degree, which is going to be in, welcome, Allison and Sandra, and your degree that you're studying is going to be in? 
My doctorate is in human sexuality. And particularly my interest is in sexuality and spirituality. So I'm very comfortable as a Unitarian Universalist with those two things, which some people have a hard time putting in the same sentence. But as Unitarian Universalist, it's, a, it's an issue of justice as well. So that's why it's, it's really important to think carefully about um, the relationships. And we think we do. As Unitarian Universalists, we do think very carefully about relationships. So. Yeah, it's interesting because I've been teaching a class for probably going close to 20 years now called Spirituality and Sexuality. Yeah. And, and well, We should talk. Yeah. My stuff goes back to like Atlantis Lemuria and, and kind of, I kind of scrape it forward from there. <laughs> Scraping, there's a visual. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, it's very interesting. Some would say, as, cause as we're talking about sexuality, that giving comes from the feminine energy. Mm. What do you think? Some would say that. And so, would you be one of them? So that's actually a, uh, an intriguing notion or question. Um, the, the idea of looking at what someone else may need and being sensitive to what someone else needs um, is sometimes people would attribute that to a mothering or a nurturing capacity. And what we understand, especially since we're such advocates around relationships, is that that capacity is really inherent in everyone. So it's not, so we, we may have this tendency to go dualistic and talk about the masculine and the feminine, and we, we don't see them quite in those, you know, opposing views. We see it as something that is the capacity, inherently is a capacity in everyone. And so that's why being Unitarian Universalists, we understand that the first principle of the inherent worth and dignity of all people means that our capacity to share, and not just to give, but to share and, and empower um, supports that, that principle. Mm -hmm. So while there are programs and we do offer financial support, we'll, we'll offer emotional support, ultimately what we're trying to, we're trying to be a mirror to the folks that we're in relationship with to, to help them understand just how worthy they are. Would that, would that sort of make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, and, it, and this is, it's a religious tradition for, it's not just a Unitarian Universalist concept in terms of giving. And many religions have that image of the mother mm -hmm. as, as part of their, um, um, their, their foundation. Um, so I, I do think that sometimes people will get reminded that um, the mother would ask that we do care. That, yeah. um, but it's, um, it's still something that it, it doesn't matter what the foundation of a religion is. I think the giving is sort of a natural part of what we try to do, if that makes sense. Well, yes, and I'm, and I'm going to, because we've moved right into the meat of the program, which is fine, and I'm going to move it right back into the initial question for a second. Uh, because when, we say, when I say masculine and feminine, I'm not talking about male, female. Correct, good. So I'm talking about the energies. And, yep. we, and I think it's important for the audience to understand that we all have both energies, mm -hmm. but also that there is a masculine form of nurturing and giving that's equally valid. Yep. And that mm -hmm. sometimes... I almost think that we've done damage by, by kind of putting out this idea that men don't have to be nurturing because it's not part of their nature. And so we've actually robbed them of that nurturing by give, sending them the messages it's not okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that doesn't happen in the UU church, but thoughts, Allison? <laughs> ah. I, I, I'm still struggling with the, the duality. Yeah. Um, uh, I think everyone has the capacity for giving and nurturing. Um, and, and I would say I actually, um, in many ways, learned the most about giving from my father. Interesting. And I would say that I did as well. Papa definitely and did. And of course, you know, it's always funny because it's Father Christmas, it's Santa Claus. <laughs> it's, That's true. You know? Mrs. Claus is staying back up there on the North Pole baking cookies. Santa's doing a whole lot of giving out there in the world on, you know, uh, the uh, night before Christmas, according to all of the Christmas lore. Lore. <laughs> lore. Um, so you guys have a very interesting way in which the church is set up to do giving. And this is something that the church started 
I believe, I know it was before you were minister, you, you came into this program and as you did as well. Um, but oftentimes there are a lot of churches today's, today that are struggling and, and, they, and you see reports the collection plates are down and the attendance is down. And, um, you know, I think that there are more converted church buildings into other things today than I saw in my whole childhood growing up. I don't, I mean, I don't think I was, I think I was in my mid to late 20s before the first time I ever saw a church that had been converted into an apartment building or an art complex or something. Right, right. You, you know, churches just didn't fail in my childhood. Mm, they right. were very quiet, but that's happening. How do you guys um, at the Unitarian Universalist Church in Nashua, you have some, you have a very interesting giving program. So can you share it with our listeners, viewers? It's the TV show, Gavin, not the radio show. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so it, it started actually, um, I think about 13 years ago, uh, 2002, 2003, right around then. Um, the congregation had actually never taken an offering before. It was not something that was in the, the ethos. Um, and so they just didn't, they didn't pass the plate during the service. Um, and there was a decision made, um, partly because they had been kind of giving some of the endowment monies to the community. There was a decision made to shift that to something that was kind of more, where people could more actively participate in the giving um, and to start taking an offering and to have that entire offering go out to a local um, community organization that was doing good work in the community. Um, and we've been doing it ever since. Um, and it's something I would say that the folks in the congregation are excited about and and proud of and at this point they don't even realize it's unusual because we do it every week um, and so the way it works is we have we actually have a um, an application form that any organization can fill out um, on our website and we have a group uh, in the congregation that kind of assesses those applications and um, they have a certain certain criteria so it has to be a a nonprofit and it has to be, um, they do kind of one non-local cause a year, but all the other ones are local, so greater Nashua area. Um, uh, and some other, you know, it has to lip, be in line with our Unitarian Universalist values as well. Um, and we have a different organization, basically each month. Sometimes we'll do the same organization for two or three months. Um, so we usually over the summer months, we do the same organization. Um, and, uh, at the end of the month, we give all the money to that organization. And, uh, usually at the beginning of the month, we have someone actually from the organization come and speak a little bit about it, uh, which is always great. I, I love, um, I, I always get to meet the person, right? Cause I have to tell them this is when you come up and this is how you do it. Um, and it's just great to have folks from the community coming into the congregation and sharing about what they do. Um, and it. I've never actually compared the numbers for the first Sunday when the person comes to speak versus the other Sundays, but my guess is when they actually have someone from the organization that it, that first Sunday is the Sunday that we get the most given. Um, now, because now are you, you guys aren't taping the service. I know you're, you're, you're simulcasting it over the web so people can go to the website and watch it. Yeah. Um, but do you actually capture a tape of that? Of the service? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so we do a couple things. One is that we, um, so we live stream audio, the yes. service, and then it gets recorded as well. Um, and we put them up. Um, yeah. Do you, now, I don't know because I haven't like plunged the depths of your website. Um, so... Do you like break out a little clip of that person speaking and say this is our charity for the month so people could just go on and watch that little clip of it instead of trying to go through the whole service to find it if they didn't go there? Yeah. But that might, I, I don't know if you do that, but if you don't, you might want to think that if it made it easier for people to click on it, that even if they weren't there, they could see what that person had to say about the charity easier or even mail the clip out as part of your email. Here's a clip if you want to watch it of our charity of the month and just take it from the service. Yeah, yeah and it is actually the way our service gets posted online is it's all broken up. 
Okay. So, so it would be easy enough to find. It would be easy enough to find. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. You know me, I'm always solution based. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How do we get more? So what's your charity? So first of all, what's your charity this month? Um, so this month, it's the Southern New Hampshire Services Fuel Assistance Program. And we that's one of the ones that we give to, I think they've been giving for several years now. Yeah. We yeah. do at least one month. Yeah. Um, and so it provides uh, assistance with energy bills for low-income uh, families and people um, who want to be able to keep their heat on. Um, so I, I think it's it's one of the really important ones, and we always do it when it's getting starting to get a little bit cold, because um, that's that's the point I think at which people are thinking about you know what would it be like to live without heat, and and how can I give how how much can I give to support people not not having to live without heat. So, um, so you take this collection every week. At the end of the month, you donate this money into this organization, and then the next month you do it. You have this as a regular one that you do. Mm -hmm. um, is there any other ones that are just like kind of pre-programmed regular? We have some, um, some that we kind of give to pretty regularly. So we almost always do something for Harbor Homes um, throughout the year. Often our Christmas Eve collection will go to um, the Harbor Homes Ending Homelessness Fund, which is a fund that some of the members of our congregations um, helped to start a few years ago. Um, we also always do a month that goes towards, we have a preschool um, in, in that was started by the church, and there's a scholarship fund um, for the preschool. So there's always a month of offerings that go towards making that scholarship fund happen. Uh, there are... Um, one that we did uh, kind of several months of this, this summer um, was End 68 Hours of Hunger, um, which is an organization that uh, works to um, provide food for kids between the free lunch they get on Friday and the free breakfast they get on Monday. Um, so that was one. We actually just, um, just wrote a check to them for almost $7,000 because we did uh, three full months of giving to them. Yeah. Also, there'll be some some children in this area who will be eating over the weekends, and they'll never know that it's because of the UU Church. Right. So we're so, so we're we're feeding, I, and I, I became a member this week, so I can say we now. Yeah. Before I was an outsider, <laughs> I was a who are you? Uh, <laughs> you can say we now. That's true. Yeah. I can say we now. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Though I always said we. Ah. Uh, I'm very inclusive in my UU. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you have these great programs that you're putting out there. Now, UU churches are known for their social justice. How do, is there, do any of these become, so, are there any of these social justice nonprofits? I mean, the nonprofits you're mentioning are, are obviously very heart-centered and feed the community, and I think that's great, but UUs are known for social justice. Are there, can you think of a one you've done recently that was social justice, or do you stay away from that? Or do they not just apply? So it would depend on um, how you would define social justice. Okay. I'll throw it back to you. <laughs> 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 like a good minister, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, something that's more a cause than a service. Hmm. You know, I, you know, ending, uh, you know, um, I would say that providing monies that are giving people food to eat and heat uh, and a place to stay are very service. And, and again, I'm not putting that down. I think yeah. that that's wonderful. But a cause might be more uh, like um, LGBT teens cause or uh, a get out the vote cause or mm -hmm. whatever, mm -hmm. just since, since elections just passed. Mm -hmm. um, but so more cause, more of something that's just a cause yeah, that doesn't right. necessarily provide a service. Do you, do you do many of those? Yes, no, not sure. I think not so much for the outreach offerings, that there, there are other ways that we support causes, but the, out, the outreach, we call it the outreach offering. <laughs> and... Um, and I think the, the focus is kind of more on, on services and, and the local stuff. Okay. Um, 
rather than, you know, it's not, we don't have any rules against it, um, but that has certainly been the focus. Okay. Yeah. So um, there was a, a, the church I was involved with in Phoenix had a very interesting um, thing that they did. And what they did is they supported a, uh, an organic, non-GMO, like really all of that stuff, farmer hmm. um, to help save his farm when they had a bad year. Um, and he was, I'm not sure if he was actually set up as a nonprofit, but what they did is they bought the church, bought shares and let the farmer come and actually hmm. deliver the shares and do a, a food thing hmm. um, to promote good eating in the church and good food and to promote the, you know, um, non-GMO, organic, great food for this thing. Is that something that you guys would ever think? I mean, does that fall into this? I guess the guy would have to have been a nonprofit, and he might have been. I'm not yeah. sure. Mm -hmm. But would this be something that would fall into the, that if it was a nonprofit? It depends. I mean, it's, it, if it, we do have the requirement that it has to be a, a sort of registered 501c3, yeah, yeah. nonprofit. Um, but... Uh, and, and I think there's also the, a part of the criteria is how much, um, how much reach do our dollars have, right? So how much, what are the organizations that we can really be impactful for? Um, so it, yeah, I, it's certainly possible if, if, if that person filled out an application and made their case using UU values, that would be, um, and and was a 501c3. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so anybody can go to the website. They don't have to have a Unitarian Universalist connection, nope. but they have to have, they have to show kind of how it follows into the principles, which I'm sure are listed. Like this is why this would fit what you're looking to support. Right. Yeah. Now I know they're gonna have this underneath you, but this is just, is this just um, UU? UUNashua.org. UUNashua.org. Yeah. So if you're a nonprofit out there, you want to go to uunashua.org and see if you may qualify um, for some of their charitable giving that they're doing in the community. Do you have any idea uh, last year, if you just look at the collection plate, do you know what you actually did in charitable giving in 2015 in the Nashua area? And I didn't um, ask you to prepare these figures. Yeah. I mean, I just basically said this was going to be a show on giving and yep. Yeah, so like we can, I can't tell you what the year 2015 was because um, we do all of our calculations in fiscal year. Um, but it, last fiscal year, we gave right. away about $40,000 to the community. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. Some, that's some significant things. Yeah. So in the time that the two of you have been involved, because both of you have, uh, are relatively new. Yeah, we arrived at the same time. Yep. We arrived at the same time. Um, yeah, how, how you guys both fit in that Volkswagen bug with everything else you had, I don't know, but you know, you did. Uh, there, there are UU miracles. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, do you, what do you think has been the most interesting, um, took you by surprise or really caught your attention nonprofit that you have hosted so far? The one that sticks out most in your mind. I have been so um, impressed and inspired by the community dinners mm -hmm. that we offer once a month. So, so there's there's many ways to give, right? So the Absolutely. giving is the, the cash that we we've talked about, and money money is helpful. Um, the other way that we give uh, monthly, and this is probably four years. Three, I think it's maybe it's maybe four, five or six. Five or six years at this so, point. Yeah. Yeah. So that the third Sunday of every month, we prepare. And open our a meal and, and open our doors to for those folks that would like a home cooked warm meal in an inviting comfortable setting. So last night we had the community dinner, and it's not even just a meal. Um, we have musicians that will play. Um, we had a beautiful setting actually. So we had our Thanksgiving yeah. tablecloths and, um, and 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 make it not just about food, but make it about community and. The meal is offered for anyone who wants to come in. So church members, church goers come in and we and their families and we share a meal with everyone together. We're all served and sit at the same table and uh, enjoy each other's company. Um, and we also do give 
folks who come in who would like extra help, some supplies if they need it. So we, um, this time of year, things like socks and hand warmers and diapers and those, those really those essentials that um, can be challenging when you're then having to spend more money on staying warm or food. You know, food. Um, so, so there's a giving that is not just about sitting and s staying seated yeah. and putting some money. It's actually about being in relationship. And that, as I mentioned at the top of the show, relationship is an important um, foundation and principle for Unitarian Universalists. So we are actively in relationship with many folks in the community. Um, and I, that to me has been amazing to see the energy that's around it. Mm -hmm. Usually some things, the, the initiative happens by a handful of people and they're, they're pretty energetic about it for a while, but you know, as things happen, you can lose steam. Absolutely. This one has been sustainable. This one has definitely been sustained. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. And has, there's been, I've seen no signs of, of, of it waning at all. It, no. Um, so I was there last night. I, um, I often go, I, I often wash dishes, which <laughs> people love seeing their minister wash dishes. Just in case you were wondering. Um, very talented. Very, very talented. <laughs> I'm not very talented, but... But I can wash dishes. That I can do. Uh, um, and I think there were 20 volunteers who were there on a Sunday night. Um, some of them were there. You know, some of them come at 2.30 and start cooking. Uh, some of them show up a little later and do the setup. Some yeah. of them come and clean up. Um, so it's, it's a, an amazing community effort in terms of making it happen, too. Um, and one of the things I remember from last year is that they put out a call... Um, the, the kind of core group that organizes the community dinners, put out a call for folks to go to uh, Costco or BJ's or one of those places to, um, to get like bulk boxes of hand and foot warmers. And they said, oh, we want to get, a, you know, approximately four of these bulk boxes or some, some, something around that number. And within a week, they had twice as many as they wanted because um, the I think the congregation is looking for way to, ways to give, that people are, um, are eager for those opportunities. Um, so that's so very how many, inspiring. So how many dinners did you serve last night? Do you have any idea, or just off the top of your head, eyeballing it, looking at it? Usually it's, some, it's somewhere between 60 and 100. Um, so last night was, was not super full, but I would say there were probably between 60 and 80 people who came and had dinner. Yeah, yeah. And, and the, the, our hope would be that as, as the months get harder and it gets colder that we can serve more, but it turns out that's, that does, we end up serving less because it gets yeah. harder for folks to get out. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and I mean this with the utmost respect, Reverend Palm. <laughs> so do they have to listen to you preach? To they eat? do not. That's actually one of the things that, um, <laughs> That, that folks say, say that they love the most about coming to the community dinners. All I do is the dishes. Yeah. I don't say, although I did have one person, every so often there's someone who says, comes and says, you know, is the pastor here? And then I'll talk to them. But, um, but no, we don't do, we don't have a service before or after. We don't, nothing like that at all. One of the things we do do that has, people have been really receptive to is um, we have, um, we have candles that we light in our services in the morning for joys and sorrows in people's lives. And we've started having just the sand and the candles out mm -hmm. and letting people know that if they want to light a candle for something throughout the dinner, um, they're welcome to do so. Uh, and I'm always amazed at how many people um, take advantage of that because everyone needs a little light, right? Yep. Um, so that's probably the closest we get to any, anything kind of overtly religious in the dinner, at the dinner. Yeah, because, you know, um, th there, there are organizations that do the dinners, but they come with a price tag, and sometimes right. people feel uncomfortable, right. like they're, you know, there's an expectation of them. So you have these people come in, they scatter at tables, and then members of the church that showed up just scatter at the tables with them and hang out and chat and really f form yeah. community. They do, yeah. and it's all ages. Yeah. It's amazing to me that that's what, that was the first time I went. How many families, how many yeah. children were there? And, and it was um, that is just a it's what you do. You went to church yeah. on the third Sunday and shared a meal with uh, and, and, and met people you didn't know. Yeah. And over over food, connected. 
and answer questions and talk to each other. And, and you know what, just acknowledging that somebody is there, exists. Um, so that's, that, that I find that valuable, that our young Unitarian Universalists um, value it as well. Um, yeah. yeah. We had a couple of our youth show up. Our youth group is at, right afterwards, and um, a couple of our youth showed up last night um, because they usually work uh, during that time and weren't working yesterday. And so they came and they helped out a little bit, and then they sat down and ate. And um, it was just great to see, see, um, see our youth just showing up, showing up early yeah. at church to be a part of community dinner. Yeah. It's really, really inspiring. Yeah. Well, and it's also... I mean, at the end of the day, the role modeling is what the children remember. Absolutely. So if the third Sunday my family goes and helps people that, that, that may be having a hard period of their life or are less fortunate yeah. or just isolated. Yeah, or just isolated. Just yeah. isolated. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that, that's a way to meet uh, new people and to connect in my community and stuff like this. And they do that. You can say until you're blue in your face, well, it's important to do community and to help people out that are less fortunate. But if they're not seeing their family do that, it yeah. has no meaning. Right. Yeah. And, you know, the funny thing is the parents might be doing it by writing a check and donating. Right. But this, the, that, has no, that, that has no texture to it as an experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, where, where this teaches a value of community and and giving and inclusion. So I, I like that. Do you want to talk about, speaking of our children, seeing models of giving, do you want to talk about area? That's a great question. <laughs> so um, when I came into the congregation, the uh, children and youth team, the, the lay leaders who are involved in the program for children and youth, uh, uh, decided that there were some Sundays that uh, they would like to bring all ages together in an effort to think carefully about outreach and social justice and giving. And they uh, would do that like once every six Sundays or so. And they called it AREA, the, the acronym is AREA, they called Alternative Religious Education Activity. So they would then allow some of the folks who uh, were unable to go to worship on Sunday, that Sunday to, to um, be in the, uh, in, in the pews and the children would meet other adults in the congregation and work on some initiative. Um, in, when I came in as the interim, so uh, my job is to ask why do you do that, and um, the reflection I made was it's not really an alter, it's core to who we are. It's not an alternative activity, it's, it's core to us as Unitarian Universalists. Mm -hmm. And for us to reach out even deeper into the congregation and, and really create those multi-generational opportunities. So sitting side by side in an effort to um, do the outreach. So for example, last fall, we uh, received money to uh, uh, support children in foster care. Well, we collected and, money. And we collected money and then bought the supplies to give each child in foster care their own personal bag because they have so little of their uh, things that, that are their own. So we, uh, the children spent time um, early in the morning looking at the duffel bags and decorating them and then when the service was over we all continued together in the dining room uh, putting uh, important items into the duffel bags and to decorate them in really fun ways. Um, and then we had monies left over and then uh, in the spring, we built bicycles for children in foster care. So the children learned from those who are skilled with that and know how to do that, assembled them. They came in boxes and they had to get out the wrenches and uh, put on the horns and the wheels and all the things that needed to happen. Uh, so that has become an integral part of the experience for children and youth in their faith formation to not just see that they, act, to actually physically engage one in in a, uh, an effort to make someone else's life better, but two, to do it um, with all ages in the congregation. Uh, and that's important. Uh, again, you, you, the, the reference you made in terms of how you feel. Um, yeah. So that, that, I, think that, that quote, I think of that quote of Maya Angelou, the people might not remember what you said or what you did, but they'll remember how you made them feel. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly the children leave with that 
that sense of I actually can make a difference. And mm -hmm. it might be that I took a crayon and I decorated the duffel bag because I'm six years old and you know, that's the way I can do that. But I still can do that and to be empowered. So the idea for us as Unitarian Universalists in Nashua is that um, it, giving and sharing and caring um, is, is not related to age, that it's something that regardless of what your age is that you can participate in um, and you do get to watch and, and see that, that modeling happen. So the, the day was, I mean, 80 duffel bags, I think, that we ended up. Um, there might have been 35 bicycles that we assembled. And then, and then the, the other piece that's significant is, um, it's important to me that they, uh, they understand the context. Mm -hmm. So that we spent time together really understanding what it's like to be someone in foster care. Um, and why, why a duffel bag? I mean, that's something that many of us just go to a, a store and buy a duffel bag, but what, what is that about? So um, it's important that we help everyone understand the story yeah. and to get, make, make this personal, to see the faces um, and to hear the stories um, because then we, we're doing our best to get rid of the other, that idea yeah. that there's the other, um, and, and to uh, appreciate that, um, uh, that life can be challenging and hard for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Um, and we can we can do something to make a difference with that. So, so that that's a program that I I would recommend it to the congregation that they continue. And I, it's I think they agree. Yes. And they definitely yeah. continue doing that. So I'm always amazed. Um, I can tell. I can I can tell when it's an area day because there's fewer adults in the service because they all want to go help with the area event. It's amazing. It's uh, probably one of the, the few things that we never have trouble getting volunteers for. We never have trouble getting volunteers for. That's a fact. Yeah. And so they learn too. And then they also, they're looking for ways to connect with um, uh, across the ages. Yeah. Um, so Absolutely. That, yeah. And again, um, it's um, the way that we all learn about each other and connect with each other when we're doing something for someone else. So there's this... Um, the, the uh, obvious goal or the original goal, and then there's this other part that we're just, we just connect. We just, you know, we get to be with each other, so. And maybe you're, here I go again, and maybe you're already doing this, but, you know, if you, if the different kids that worked on it that, that said that they would be interested in doing it actually put a note in the bag that they signed, they did and that, they did. actually, yeah. Did they, yeah. Actually did. Did they yeah. do a, and, and set it up that the person could pen pal them through the church? So that's a great question. That, and and I, actually, someone had asked about that. And apparently, that's not something that the, the organization we work with would, would be able to execute yeah. uh, to administer. They thought it would be a great idea, but they did not have the infrastructure in place to be able to do that. Yeah. yeah. So many of these kids, you know, a pen pal could be a lifesaver mm -hmm. for them yeah. when yeah. they're going through tough times, feeling like somebody cares about them. Isn't that true? Yeah. So, yeah, there we go again. You can go start that organization next, right? I can start, uh, yeah, right. Uh -huh. that, start that organization. So as, as, a, as a new member, that's your first that's initiative. Your first. <laughs> <laughs> no, my, my, my first initiative is to, to continue to help raise, raise the profile of the Unitarian Universalist Church, Thank which you. this is, uh, first of all, it's Hudson Community TV. But this is the church that people in Hudson would go to as well, because there's the not a UU the church. The Nashua area. Yeah, yeah. greater yeah. Nashua area, yeah. but I'm yeah. saying as a, that it is. But um, recently, you know, we now have stations that are carrying us in Vermont all the way down to New Jersey. Last week we picked up California has oh, some awesome. stations that are really? yeah. carrying our show. And yeah. if, we are car if you're carrying our show, we may not know. You can get it without us knowing. Please, you know, send a little note to me, Dr. Kevin at weboflight.com. Let us know that you're now watching us wherever, and we'll greet you as we try to greet everybody that joins us. You're likely to have a Unitarian Universalist church in your area. Yep. They're all over. They're all over. Um, yeah. And though Unitarian Universalist churches are individual, the thing you do with the collection plate is not done by every Unitarian Universalist right. church. This is something this church. If you're a Unitarian Universalist, you may be watching this um, you know, in Dubuque and say, I want to bring this to my UU church. I think that this is a great idea or that's a great idea because UUs are notorious thieves gladly stealing from each other any good ideas as 
that, that the person stolen from would want, only want it that way. Yeah. The highest form of flattery. We love to <laughs> not reinvent the wheel. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So you're doing some great work in the community. Why is giving so important? And what does it do for the giver? We heard Anne Frank. Can we, uh, can we go back and bring up the uh, quotes again? Yeah. No one has ever become poor by giving, said Anne mm -hmm. Frank. It is in giving that we receive, said Francis of Assisi. And a man wrapped up in himself makes a very small bundle, says Benjamin Franklin. So what would you say to people who are saying, I don't have anything to give, or I'm so poor, or I'm so busy, or I'm so stressed out? What does giving do to the giver? And why should somebody give? I always think giving is, is actually kind of a core spiritual practice for folks. Um, and there's, uh, there's a way in which giving allows us to understand that we are a part of something bigger than ourselves, that, um, which is one of my core beliefs, is that it's not just me, right? It's not just you, that, that we're a part of something that's much larger, and, and that we are, in fact, connected to each other, um, and we need one another. Uh, so I think giving is just a really important reminder of that and a way to kind of get out of yourself um, and, and connect with other people. Um, and I think it's, it's kind of intricately tied up with gratitude in a lot of ways, that there's, there's ways in which uh, gratitude begets giving and giving begets gratitude, right? That there is, um, uh, that you can't, that you can't be, be grateful without wanting to give back. And you can't really give back without ending up being grateful. Hmm. Thoughts you'd like to share on that? Yeah, I, I, I really value this question. Uh, it's, an, it's an important one uh, around our relationship to things and to, to money. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been actually having some conversation and running adult programs around spirituality and, and giving. Yeah. Um, and uh, this idea that we might live um, with this fear that, um, that there's so little mm -hmm. and yet the, the abundance is there. So to invite people into s seeing with abundance versus this, this fear of scarcity or this attitude or belief that there's scarcity. Um, and changing, just changing that framework, for, for, first off makes you, I think puts us in that place of gratitude for all that we do have. Um, because when you look at the, half, the glass half empty, half full kind of thing, it's like, well, but it still has something in it. No matter where it is, it still has something in it. And to, to start by being appreciating that the, the glass is not even empty, that it has something in it. Um, and then the relationship you have towards your own sense of money Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think that, that part of doing this through uh, a spiritual practice, and I really appreciate that, that acknowledgement, is, is, the, is abundance versus scarcity. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to the grocery store um, and I, I'm putting in three items extra, um, you know, uh, uh, versus the idea that oh, I'm going to go to the grocery store and get my groceries and then leave there and go to Dunkin' Donuts and get, you know, three cups of coffee and... You know, so there's, there's ways that you actually have control, um, and you can make those de decisions. Um, and, it, and, and you can start small. I think we sometimes get to this point of looking, when you start talking about 501c3s and endowments, and you start thinking in terms of uh, very full financial portfolios, mm -hmm. and uh, it's actually a lot simpler than, than that. Um, I, I know a family that they, the, the children had allowance, and they would sit down with them every week and say a third of the allowance goes to... Um, something that, to savings, a third would go to something that you would like to, to, if you want to buy something, and a third you have to give away. So as they were five and six years old, they learned early how, how far a, a little bit of an allowance can go for themselves yeah. and for others. Um, so I, I, I think that's really, in terms of the spiritual relationship to this, um, the idea of giving, and the question you have, what do you get back? Um, uh, you get back an, an awareness that your life actually is more full and has more to it than you might, you might believe, if that makes sense. Um, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, one of the things, because I, I teach a Keys to Prosperity class, a Prosperity Manifestation course, things like this, and those who live in lack 
have a world that's lacking. Those who live in abundance have an abundant world. Mm. And that whole mindset is so important mm. to see that. And, you know, there's, uh, there's something that everybody can do uh, when it comes to giving, even if it just starts by giving somebody the time of day. Hmm. You know, um, it isn't all about money. It's not no, all that's about stuff. I think that's really that's important really to lift important. up. So we talk about time, talent, and treasure. I mean, just in terms of a framework. Yep. And so giving can be just that you say hello to someone and make eye contact and give them a few seconds of your time, okay. you know, just to acknowledge that, that, they're, that they're there. Um, so I, I think sometimes giving gets equals dollar sign, and I really appreciate you lifting up that that's not that yeah. that's not true. Yeah. And I want to bring this back to the community dinner because the other thing is, um, though I always say the universe abhors an imbalance, mm. and that when you go and I've I've been in places and participated in places where the people serve the people that are out there the food, but they hang out in the kitchen together and talk and eat. And it's kind of like, oh, we're doing this good stuff for these people. Mm. And that time investment that mm. the, the, yeah, the, the people within the church make okay. to sit down and say, I not only want to share food with you because maybe you're having a hard time and we all have them, or maybe you just need community but I find value in having dinner with you mm. and that will go more to feed someone's soul yeah. Yeah. to go hey you know and maybe some elderly person that goes because they're all alone or they're you know they're they're isolated may be able to share a story with some young kid that laughs or gets a lot out of it and that that person's week has been made Mm -hmm. because they feel like they still have value. Yep. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's important, and I think it's important for the viewers to understand how much we can disenfranchise at times the elderly and the young. Mm -hmm. You're not old enough to do anything. I can pick up a crayon and I can put a, I can draw on that duffel bag. Right. Yeah. You're too old. You got stories and wisdom, and you've seen things that we'll never see again. Yeah. Share your stories, share your wisdom. Mm -hmm. Not your judgment, not your bigotry, not your good old days of why everything's so horrible, but share your wisdom. You wanted to say something. Oh, I was just going to say, um, just thinking about last night at the community dinner again, we had our youngest person who was volunteering was seven, and our oldest person was somewhere in their 70s. So we had the whole range and they were all giving something that was really important um, and there was no I love that there's um, always in, in, in those community dinners especially and we try to do this in our church more broadly is um, make space for people of every age and every ability to be able to give because it is so important and so uh, so meaningful for everyone Sometimes, because I have worked in the past with people with disabilities, and sometimes it is people enabling them that disable them more than anything else mm. and making them feel like they can't take care of themselves or they can't do for themselves or, you know, or they give up or they just, you know, uh, um, and they learn to manipulate the system instead of them getting empowered of everybody has something to give. Everybody has value. I have never in my life sat down with anybody and spent time and not been able to find value in them. Hmm. But we don't teach that principle. I mean, we don't teach it in, in, in education. We teach it in Unitarian Universalist, to really just faith formation. Well, in everything we do. In everything the, we do, the, yeah. The, uh, the first of the seven Unitarian Universalist principles is the inherent worth and dignity of all people. So we're having a community dinner because this is our community our collective community. Yeah. Okay, so what, um, if somebody, well, first of all, if somebody wants to find out more about the stuff that's going on with the Nashua or even at a UU, again, you know, we're, 
we're now coast to coast. Yeah. Coast to coast. We're coast to coast. Yeah. That was my goal, that I could say that before December. Nice um, job. You did it. <laughs> um, and um, where would people go if they want to find out more about these principles and these things? And I'm going to put on you on the spot between the, the two of you. Can you can you come up with can you share the seven principles by heart? Either oh, yeah, we can do it. Right. First is so the inherent worth and dignity of every person. So I think it's important to start with um, a piece of the preamble, which is mm. that we affirm and promote. So. So for each of these, we affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Um, uh, we affirm and promote justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. We affirm and promote a world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all, mm -hmm. something like that. Um, we uh, affirm and promote um, a the use of the democratic process. The use of the democratic process, both in our congregations and in society at large. Um, the one I was going to say is the free and responsible search for truth and meaning. Um, respect for one another uh, and... We affirm and promote the, uh, the interdependent web of life of which we all exist. Yeah, of we're a part. Yeah. Now, how recently were those just updated again? So they actually, um, originally, there were six principles that were, I believe, in 84, 85. Mm -hmm. um, and then the seventh was added just, just a few years later. So they're, um, they're from the 80s. They're all from the 80s. Uh, and they haven't been changed since. There's been some conversation about changing them, uh, kind of making minor changes, but, um, but it hasn't hasn't come to anything that folks can agree on. Do you think that there are people in our viewing audience who may belong to one of the more what they would think of as traditional? We had you on a show before. Mm -hmm. You can go back into the archives. You can go to our YouTube channel, our Web of Light YouTube channel, and you can watch the interview I did with these ladies before. Um, but somebody who, let's say, was involved in a more traditional religion, a more traditional Protestant religion or whatever, that is surprised or would be surprised by the rewriting of the principles and that it's, a, a, it's an ongoing conversation? Or do you think that that happens in most religions? I think it happens in some and not all. I think, um, you know, we, we talk about the idea that uh, we don't think revelation is sealed, and I don't think we're alone in that. Um, but I think there would certainly be, um, there may not be other, a lot of other faiths that allow their core principles to be decided upon through the democratic process, which is, is actually how the principles, um, were originally affirmed is by our general assembly, which is a once a year meeting of delegates from all our congregations. So you have your own electoral co college. <laughs> I don't think we should go down that. Yeah, I yeah, really don't think dangerous. we should go down that. Pouring <laughs> <laughs> uh, salt and open wound. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but, but we have polity. It's congregational polity, and that the, yeah. the you know this this is not the top down power. Right. You know this is you know this we all think about these things and m make these decisions collectively and together. If that makes right. a difference. Yeah. I will guarantee you that there are people that are out there that go, your congregant has a say in the core principles of your religion? Yeah. How does that work? On that note, we are wrapping down. I forgot <laughs> to give you the five minute warning because I was so engaged in the conversation with the two of you as I always am. Uh, I want to thank Reverend Allison Palm and Sandra Greenfield, who is the uh, Director of Faith Formation uh, at the Nashua UU Church. And you can find out more about them at uunashua.org. Yes. And if you want to find more about other UU congregations, you can go to uua.org. uua.org. And, um, you know, today's show is about giving and the importance of giving. I wore this shirt. Now make sure everybody can see it. Me ate your gift. Now the funny thing is,
when I bought the shirt with the Cookie Monster, Me Ate Your Gift, I felt like, well, that was Cookie Monster saying that he took somebody else's gift and ate it on them. And then I thought, well, you know, sometimes the best gifts you can get are home-baked goods. Maybe somebody gave him a gift, and he's just saying, me ate your gift. Thank you. It was so good. It was so good. It was yeah. so good. Yeah. There's always time to give. And it is actually scientifically proven that when you are of service and give, that it creates additional brain chemistry that makes you feel better about yourself, about the world, and you are likely to be more optimistic. If you struggle with thinking it's a sad or crazy or bad world, if you struggle with depression, dark days, things like this, a little giving could go a long way into giving you a better world and make the world a better place. Two for one, gotta love it. Namaste. Thank you.